So I put this on to take a thumbnail, but could I do the whole review with it? Am I even talking at the camera? I don't know. I don't know where anything is. There's a vague glow of a ring light and, and, and I'm quite peaceful right now. <sighs> oh my God, hey. I mean, oh my God, hey, there you are. Welcome back to my theater themed YouTube channel. This is ridiculous, excuse me. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theater, which is why I recently, somewhat recently, went to New York to go and see a bunch of Broadway and off-Broadway shows. However, this is neither of the two, because this was a unique concert presentation as part of New York City Center Encore's 30th anniversary season. And it is also the reason why we flew to New York in January. So if you're meeting me today for the first time, I am a professional theater critic here on social media. And when I found out that Sutton Foster, Tony Award winner Sutton Foster, who I was lucky enough to see as Reno Sweeney in Anything Goes when it came to the Barbican here in London when I heard that Sutton was going to be starring in a concert version of Once Upon a Mattress as Princess Winifred. I thought there is absolutely no way that I can miss it. So we planned a trip to New York which I've already covered in a three-part vlog series here on my channel. If you want to know what else we saw, what we ate, what we got up to, you can go and check out those vlogs. But today I'm going to be bringing you my full review of this concert version of the show. And this only ran between January 24th and February 4th. And you may be asking yourself, why am I reviewing this now when it's already closed? Well, hopefully, if you know nothing about the Encores concerts, this will give you a little bit of an indication as to what you might expect with an Encores show. How staged are they? What kind of pedigree might we be expecting? They have other shows coming up this season. But also, just because these shows begin their lives as concerts doesn't mean they always stay that way. More on that in a minute. For now, if you enjoy today's video, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for more Broadway and West End theatre reviews coming very soon. I can't tell you when I'm going to be back in New York because I haven't booked flights yet, but I am hoping to be back this spring because there are so many exciting things opening. Not to mention Sutton Foster, leading lady of Once Upon a Mattress, is now starring as Mrs. Lovett in the revival of Sweeney Todd at the Lunt Fontan. I can't miss that. Honestly, her work ethic this year is responsible for a great many of my air miles. Also, one of my favourite things about reviewing classic shows like this is getting to hear other people's thoughts about them. If you saw Once Upon a Mattress at Encores, comment down below, but if you've seen a prior version of the show, if you've been in a prior version of the show, comment down below with all of your thoughts about it as well. For now, let me tell you what I thought about Once Upon a Mattress in concert at New York City Center, right after this sneak peek of the show's curtain call. Okay, so first of all, some context on what Encores actually is, because I'm aware I've said it many times without really explaining. This is a season of semi-staged concert productions that take place every year at a venue called New York City Center. And as far as I understand, their original aim was to spotlight sort of lesser known shows like Forgotten Gems, flops even, resurrecting them from the history books and giving them a lush outing. I say lush because as a result of the fact that these are very short runs, only this year for the first time are they doing two week runs, normally it's even shorter, that allows them to A, engage big stars to participate, but also it means they can afford an expansive, glorious orchestra, this year under the direction of Mary Mitchell Campbell. And so these concerts really are a treat and they're increasingly semi-staged. We have some version of a set and we have costuming. The first one I ever saw was around this time last year. I saw Donna Murphy in Dear World. And as far as I can tell, Encore's shows 
do seem to be becoming slightly more elaborate and slightly more full. There are also many that have actually sparked Broadway transfers, including the long-running production of Chicago, currently playing at New York's Ambassador Theatre, likely the production that you associate with the musical Chicago. That actually began its life as a semi-staged concert presentation at Encores that people thought was only going to be around for a few days. It's now been running on Broadway for over two decades, but its origins as a concert go some of the way towards explaining the stripped back nature of the show with the band on stage. And that's not the only one. There have been many in the intervening years, but also quite a few recently. Uh, the revival of Into the Woods on Broadway with the all-star cast, the recent revival of Parade with Ben Platt and Michaela Diamond. And so following on from all this, needless to say, anytime something is successful at Encores, there is always discourse about whether or not it's going to transfer to Broadway, even though that's not strictly speaking what Encores was originally about. In the case of Once Upon a Mattress, however, this very much aligns with the mission statement because this older show that is best known for being a vehicle for comedy icon Carol Burnett has been sort of increasingly becoming a relic in the musical theatre history books. It was first seen on Broadway in 1960 starring Carol Burnett. Both Burnett and the production were nominated for Tony Awards. The only major Broadway revival that followed was one in 1996 starring Sarah Jessica Parker. It has had multiple made-for-TV adaptations, all of which have starred Carol Burnett in some capacity, but it's very much what you might call an old-fashioned musical. A little less so now, as this latest mountain features a revised new book from writer Amy Sherman Palladino, best known for having written Gilmore Girls, as well as the TV series Bunheads, which starred Sutton Foster. It all makes sense. But what is Once Upon a Mattress actually about, I hear you ask? And so I will tell you, Once Upon a Mattress is the story of a sad, lonely prince named Prince Dauntless, whose mother is preventing him from being able to marry. She has impossibly high standards for any young princess he could take as his wife, a ostensibly because she doesn't trust him to subsequently become king and run the kingdom by himself. Either that or she's clinging to power, you can decide. But after having refused countless perfectly viable matches, the Queen comes to regret these decisions upon the arrival of Princess Winifred. Now, Winifred is our central protagonist, and she is a princess, but she is an unconventional princess to say the least. When she is brought to the kingdom in her enthusiasm, she leaps off of the horse she is riding in on, swims the moat, and scales the castle walls. She is coming from a swamp kingdom, making her a swamp princess. And what she lacks in shame, she makes up for with confidence which is actually a winningly charming combination. And just as it may not surprise you to hear that many in the kingdom are initially indifferent to her, it also may not surprise you to learn she eventually wins them over with her endearing personality and kindness. But the queen is not so easily convinced and she devises a test of sensitivity in which Winifred will have to detect the presence of a pea beneath dozens of mattresses interrupting her perfectly good night's sleep in order to succeed and be able to marry the prince. So for those of you who are brushed up on your fairy tales, it's the story of the princess and the pea with a little bit more flavour. It also has shades of Shrek the Musical in there, being an unconventional twist on a fairy tale, and specifically Shrek the Musical's princess character, Princess Fiona, a role which Sutton Foster originated on Broadway. You start to understand how all of this comes together. But that is what the show is actually about. Let me tell you what I thought of this version. So though I don't know if it's one of the more commercially viable things for them to be producing, like an Into the Woods or like a Parade, I think that this is what Encores does best, and I love Encores shows like this. First of all, the score sounded so rich and so full and fantastic. This is how every classic musical theatre score should sound. The set, though minimal, was absolutely as functional as it needed to be. We had this castle with levels and corridors and walls, which could be scaled. We had set pieces that came on to create different locations. We had a sort of a bed that could have various different mattresses piled on it that Sutton Foster as Princess Winifred could actually scale and sleep on top of. I mentioned before the legendary Mary Mitchell Campbell was the music director, David Zinn was responsible for the scenic design, but Andrea Hood as the costume designer did some of my favourite visual work in this production because these costumes, so vibrant, so colourful, so hypersaturated and fairy tale with this classic style, but also J. Harrison G's character who was the jester, had this fantastic costume combining different like traditionally masculine and feminine elements, I loved that. And more so than anything else, 
these costumes just had character. Harriet Harris's costume as the queen was so ornate and so regal. And then you have Sutton coming in, the absolute contradiction of that with this hiked up skirt and this crazy wig with things coming out of it and these like swamp drenched clothes. She is completely at odds with everyone else visually. And then when she changes, she has this playful short bob, not a million miles from her thoroughly modern Millie hair, I will say, for which she obviously won her first Tony Award. But then they put her in this vibrant yellow, which is a big change from how we first meet her, but is so correct for the joy with which she has characterized this character. Everything about how they style her in the show is wacky and zany and over the top, which is exactly what it should be. It's camp, the whole thing, except exceptionally camp, high camp in fact, and I thoroughly enjoyed the production itself. I thought it was effervescent in its charm, directed by Leah de Bassinet and choreographed by Lauren Lataro. In particular, the choreography of Song of Love, when Michael Urey as Prince Dauntless is singing I'm in love with a girl named Fred, and Sutton Foster is running around the stage in this circuit between these different activities, each of which is becoming more elaborate. And she's doing traditionally non princessy and unladylike things, like she's drinking beer and she's jumping into a split, and it's just wild. Also, the Spanish Panic danced by the ensemble, brilliant. All of which is to say, I had a lovely time enjoying this show for what it is. At no point did I think, you know what, this is ripe for a Broadway revival. Because the Encores has done what it needs to with this show. It has showcased it and highlighted it and allowed us to enjoy it. But I didn't really think that the updated book from Amy Sherman Palladino had done enough to make this feel sort of necessary for a contemporary audience. Like it's charming and it's joyous and it's campy, but it wasn't all the way to a laugh riot. And if it's going to be this kind of an insincere musical, it has to be completely hilarious. The book did a great job in retaining a lot of that classic character because it didn't feel like a really modern script foisted onto this old fashioned show. But an example of one where I think it refreshed the material slightly more would be Douglas Carter Bean's new book for Rodgers and Hammerstein's version of Cinderella. Like the Queen has great material and Winifred has great material because Amy Sherman Palladino can write nothing like a wacky leading lady who talks at a million miles per hour. But some of the subplot stuff, and uh, Sir Harry and Lady Larkin and this joke that he has about his spurs. I don't know if that's from the new book or from the original book, but that aged rapidly over the show when it just kept getting brought back up. The first few times it's funny that he's vacuous enough to keep talking about them, but this joke that arrived like a newborn was close to retirement by the end of this musical. We'd heard it so many times. All in all, I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I enjoyed it through that nostalgic lens. But again, that is what Encores is. That is what it does. I don't think we should go into every Encores show with the expectation of, could this work on Broadway? Could this transfer to Broadway? I don't think that needs to be the mark of Encores success. Let me tell you about some of the other things I loved about this show. I love the way the introduction builds slowly towards the arrival of Winifred and thereafter it's just this vehicle for her and she is just utterly show-stopping at every turn. I'm going to talk about the performances next, don't worry. I do like the romantic subplot between Lady Larkin and Sir Harry and we get some lovely music to go with that. Like this show does a good job of combining hilarious, wacky, ridiculous book with charming, sincere, legitimately stirring, beautiful music. However, he is a cartoon and everyone else in the kingdom is a cartoon and she is just a little too sincere. Like she has this whole thing where she's pregnant but no one's allowed to get married because Dauntless hasn't got married yet and so it's this whole thing no one can marry until he marries and he's never gonna marry because his mother's a control freak. But she fears that she will be shamed for her pregnancy and it's just difficult to feel the tension and concern of that because everyone in this kingdom is a clown. So it's hard to imagine anyone's actually going to care that much about it. Perhaps if she were to be played, directed or written with a little more eccentricity if she were to be even just a little more highly strung because she is clearly the more sensible out of the two of them in that relationship and she has various points in the show where she seems very tense because of everything that's going on. I think she just needs to be a little more comic herself rather than being the one serious person amidst fools. We do have other characters. We have a king who is cursed with silence. We also have a jester and a wizard who have a little bit of an interaction. There used to be a minstrel who has been cut from this version of the show. The jester and the wizard exist largely just to move the plot 
forwards and then to tie it up neatly at the end as well as to do bits of narration. And I feel like in a revision of the book they could have a little more material that allows them to be a little more participatory in the events of the show the whole way through rather than just at the end. But I did truly love this show. I was gleefully smiling the entire time and I thought it was deliciously silly. Now let me tell you about the performances that I got on a plane for. So obviously I have plenty to say about leading lady Sutton Foster. Now I've gone on record to say I wasn't sure about her casting as Mrs. Lovett in Sweeney Todd and I still haven't seen her in that role, but one thing I was immediately convinced of was that she was perfect for Princess Winifred. A, we had already seen her deliver something very near to that characterization with Princess Fiona in Shrek the Musical. She's already giving you like unconventional swamp princess by the end of it basically. But this is also my favorite type of a Sutton Foster role. Role, one where she is allowed to be uninhibited in her goofiness and her comedy and there is no concern about looking demure and pretty and elegant. She had spoken before in interviews about Reno Sweeney and Anything Goes being a little out of her comfort zone and even in something like Bunheads, her first really big TV role, this was something where she was playing an ex-dancer but she was still leading with comedy and leading with wacky comedy. As well as being this incredible singing and dancing talent, she is a hilarious comedian and she is not cast in those roles nearly enough because we don't have enough of those leading lady roles. That is normally going to be the supporting character who isn't fronting the production numbers. But for want of a more articulate word, her Winifred was absolutely wild from the moment that she clambered over those set pieces barefoot, pulling leeches off of her back. Carol Burnett's are exceptionally intimidating shoes to step into, and I don't know if anyone else could have done this this well. She landed every single joke. Her delivery of so many of these comedy moments has stayed with me when Lady Larkin bursts into the room and mistakes her for a servant and orders her around, and she just immediately goes with that, and she's like shaking her head and like trying to sort things out and being intimidated and, and forgetting that she isn't actually a servant. Not to mention this like, pentathlon that she's doing on the stage at the end of the first act, like I said, into the splits and doing costume reveals and doing like a beer keg, like mad, mad behavior throughout this show. Her wit and her sarcasm and her delivery are so, so good, but also her physical comedy when she eventually gets on top of this pile of mattresses and it's timed so, so well. I think because she's a brilliant singer, she understands the timing of this comedy and there's enough of a pause before she starts to shuffle and then like almost flings herself off of the top of all of these mattresses as she's like jostling around and jumping up and down trying to get comfortable. That goes on for such a long time, but it's not at all overstaying its welcome. It's, it's so well played. In short, she was absolutely a star worthy of the vehicle and I'm so glad that she got to play this role. Thrilled that I got to see it. And given that all of my enthusiasm was wrapped up in my expectations of how good Sutton Foster was going to be in this show, which were met, I had not anticipated how great Michael Urie was going to be. I didn't get to see him in Spamalot that same week because he had just left the show to go and do this as well as TV projects, but he was incredible in this as Prince Dauntless. He was hilarious. He is obviously a comedic actor first, but I enjoyed his vocal moments because they were characterful. It wasn't the most beautiful singing that you've heard, but it sounded very much like the voice of a sheltered prince in a way. And he wasn't attempting an earnest vocal performance when he was singing in particular this song with his father in the second act in which he is trying to teach him about the realities of lovemaking. He was singing it with the same sort of spoiled affectation that he had been delivering all of his spoken lines. I can still hear his line reading at the beginning of the show when they were auditioning all of these other princes of arguing with his mother and saying, look, she's smart, mama. Like, it was, oh, so funny. And his chemistry with Sutton Foster's Winifred, there is nothing more lovable in this show than the instant like that he has for her and his sort of wide-eyed grin the minute that she bursts in chaotically. It's his instant acceptance of her and all of her strangeness that has us rooting for this relationship the entire time. It's a very feel-good show in that respect. 
But these two are not the only campy comedy characters on the stage because we also have the legendary Harriet Harris. And this is a reunion in many ways because she is returning as this sort of an antagonist character, having played the villainous Mrs. Mears in the original Broadway company of Thoroughly Modern Millie opposite Sutton Foster over two decades ago. She is perfect as the queen. She is deliciously shady. She has these couple of little hysterical moments and these withering speeches. She's a great deal more perceptive and nervous knowing than a lot of the fools orbiting around her on the stage, including her son. But it's this sort of a soft-spoken delivery that she's quite well known for. It's not dissimilar to what Catherine O'Hara does to great acclaim in Schitt's Creek. I could honestly hear it a dozen times over in a dozen different characterizations, and I still wouldn't be sick of it. I also thought J. Harrison G. was very charismatic, leading us into the show as the jester, obviously sounded fantastic. Francis Jew, I thought, was absolutely charming as the wizard. It took me a little while to get a hold on his characterization, just because I don't think he had enough material to really be forthcoming with that. And then we had this romantic subplot between Nikki Renee Daniels and Cheyenne Jackson. And he has this one note buffoonish knight character, but of course he sounded fantastic and gorgeous. He has this beautiful baritone voice and he was very funny, just unironically delivering his foolish, foolish dialogue. And I had mentioned before that hers is not my favorite character in this show, just because I feel like she's a little out of step with how cartoonish everyone else is. She almost has a little bit too much depth, in fact, like she has motivations and concerns and dare I say it, nuance. But Nikki Renee Daniels also sounds just glorious singing this material. When they are singing In A Little While, it is a beautiful duet between these two wonderfully matched Broadway voices. But that has been my review of Once Upon a Mattress at New York City Center as part of Encores. Like I told you, this production has already concluded its run. However, I hope that this encourages you to go and seek out more encores presentations later this year and in the future. In fact, over the next few weeks, they will be staging a concert presentation of Jelly's Last Jam, and then later this year in June, it will be Titanic the Musical. I'm very curious. Let me know down below if you have tickets for any of those, and also what other encores shows you've seen in the past. For now, I hope that you've enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for many more reviews coming very soon about all of your favourite shows. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. Ooh. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>